Hey everybody and welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me today. In this video, I'm gonna do something a bit different and cover the absolute basics of Daz Studio. Thank you very much for subscribing and hitting the notification icon. That really helps me out. And of course, a huge thank you to all of my patrons and members. Your names are gonna be running across the bottom of the screen and I'm just in crazy grateful for your support. So when you first load up Daz Studio, your interface is not going to look an awful lot like this. There's going to be more panels on the left hand side and these panels aren't going to be identical. And the first thing I'll say about that is do not panic. The interface is basically completely drag and drop. You can move stuff to wherever you want. You can undock and then you can redock. Uh, in any of these tab panes. It's entirely up to you where you have things. I don't even have a lot of my panes docked at all. I have them undocked and then on my other monitor, which allows me more free space to play around with on this side of things. So I'm not gonna give you a, a best way of laying out your windows because everybody does things differently and you will find the more you use DAS, the more you will use different panes so the panes that I use the most often I have on the right hand side here right next to the viewport and then things like my content library, my render settings, my simulation settings, the things that I use regularly but not as often as the scene tab or the parameters tab, they're docked on the left hand side and also having them on a different monitor means that I can have those tabs nice and big so I can see more of the content in my content library rather than just the one little sliver or the two little slivers of icons that you can see in the standard interface. But if you don't have two monitors, then obviously having it docked on the left hand side is fine. And then you can expand and retract those tabs by clicking on the yellow bar beside that tab. So that's quite a useful thing to do. Accessing any windows or tabs that you don't currently have is, is as simple as just clicking on the window uh, in the top bar and then where it says panes or tabs you've got all of your available tabs here and you can toggle them on and off by using this. You can also change the color and the general layout of your uh, workspace by going into workspace and selecting layout and then you can download templates um, and use one of these. These are all different. Um, personally, I don't uh, tend to bother with those, but those are options available to you as well. So if you're anything like me, you've probably downloaded Das Studio and jumped straight in. You haven't really read any of the instruction manuals or anything like that, which is fair enough. So on the top here, I've got, these are kind of like the buttons that you're gonna use almost constantly. You've got the option to add different things and then you've got your different tools here. So you can add cameras, you can add uh, distant lights, you can add point lights. You can add linear point lights, spotlights, primitives like spheres and planes. You can create groups and add nulls. Um, and then these are kind of like your, you've got your move tool, your pan, your pan and uh, button there it allows you to move the camera in the WASD format. You've got the selection tool. You've got the universal tool. I tend not to use it very much purely because there's a lot going on and quite often it's very small on the screen and click you know, it's quite easy to misclick. So I tend to, if I'm going to do anything, is I use either the rotate tool or the move tool or the scale tool. Although to be fair, I very rarely use the scale tool. Then you've got the active pose tool and these are all again I'm not going to go through every single button because we'll be here all day but these are the buttons that you're going to use on kind of like a, a fairly constant basis to edit your scenes and maneuver and manipulate things around then you've got your simple uh, new scene uh, open existing file um, save 
those kind of functions are there, but those are also obviously available from hitting the file option on the uh, top bar as well. Below that, you've got your bridges, so you can enable Photoshop bridge. You can go into um, Hexagon. You can go into ZBrush if you've got it. That's to Maya doesn't work at the moment, so don't worry about that one. And then at the bottom here, what I've got laid out here is the timeline. And this is used for animation. Now it's worth saying right now, Dash Studio is not animation software. It was never intended to be used for animation. It was always for uh, creating 3D still images using the RA engine. It's kind of a function that's been shoehorned in there and it's really not ideal. If you want to do really basic animations, it's, it's okay in a pinch but it's not very intuitive. There's no soft body physics. There's no physics at all of any kind in there. Um, so if you can use other software, I would highly advise avoiding using DAS for animation, but if you absolutely have to, then it's an option that's there if you really want to get on and do some. So now we bring in my other tabs. And as you can see, I've got shaping, which is how you apply morphs to your characters. You've got deform, which is how you create custom kind of manipulations of your shapes. Tool settings, now this is gonna change. This is a contextual menu, so it'll change dependent on which of the tools you have selected. And again, the more you play around with those, the more you're gonna to get to use this um there's a lot to talk about in that one so too much for a beginner's tutorial anyway simulation settings is where you set up your environment and your simulation options for deforce so if you're using deforce clothing or hair this is where you'll control the overall uh, simulation the overall environment for each individual item there are options within their surfaces tab to enable you to change the properties of each individual deforce item you don't do that from this tab render settings this is where you're going to um, optimize your scene and get it ready to render out your final image and we're going to come back to this pane in a moment Then you've got your smart content and your content library. And this is different because what happens is the content library just shows you everything that you own in a in its file structure as you've got it saved on your hard drive, which means that if you know where everything is, it can be quite quick and easy to use, but it can also be a bit of a pain to find things because you'll find the more products you have, you could have thousands of different poses hundreds of different folders and it's going to become really quite tiresome trying to find things and that's where smart content comes in smart content is a contextual menu that will show you everything that you can use based on what you have selected in the scene now i currently have nothing selected in the scene so i can see my entire content library within reason but if i was to add a character that this suddenly will change and it will only show me things that i can use on that character such as poses um, such as hair such as wardrobe items and things like that so the content library is probably going to be less and less used the more and more content you have um, there are unfortunately some products that you're going to buy from maybe third party sites or um, even from the DAS Studio marketplace themselves that do not install properly or at all via the DAS Install Manager. So you'll have to install those manually and quite often those won't have any metadata attached to them and you probably won't want to spend all of your time adding metadata for products that you've bought or downloaded when there should already be some. So sometimes you will have to go back to your content library and find those products manually but the majority of the time you'll be okay just using your smart content.
So in the render settings, once you've got your scene set up, you've got everything as you want it. This is where we decide firstly what the dimensions of our image are going to be. Now, personally, I always render 16 by 9 because that's the resolution of most people's screens these days. And most people are still gaming at 1080p. So in order for me to enable manual oversampling, I render at 2880 by 1620. That's one and a half times bigger than it needs to be. That means that when I shrink it down to reduce some of that noise, they're still getting a nice high resolution image. It's not going to be blurred or stretched out in any way. Render type most of the time, unless you're doing animations, is going to say still images and you're going to leave it like that. Then you say render target. I always say new window so that I can see what's happening. It allows me to stop rendering early if I can get away with it. You can just render straight to a file, but then obviously you can't see how the progress of the render is coming along. So you tend to have to just wait for it to finish and hope for the best. Um, again, that's probably the least desirable of the two options because if you're fairly new to Daz, you're going to want to see how your renders look. You want to check the lighting. You're going to want to check the poses the, and everything. Um, and you don't want to get three hours into a render only to find out that one of your characters is pulling a stupid facial expression or is clipping halfway through a wall or something. So yeah, definitely worth leaving it in new window. Image name, you're going to do that once the render finishes, you tell it what name to save the image as. And the image path is where you're going to save your images to. Auto headlamp should always say never. There is never, ever, 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 ever a good reason to use auto headlamp on your cameras. It makes your pictures look ugly and it's just don't don't ever use it. It's ridiculous. Render mode, photo reel. No need to change that. Progressive rendering is where you tell Das Studio how long you want your images to render for. Now, that doesn't mean that if you have them all set to minimum, it's going to render super quick and the image is going to be amazing. This is how you tell Das Studio, I want the render to run for 5,000 iterations and I want it to run for a minimum of five or however many you think you want it to run for. Um, personally, I don't tend to tell it anything on uh, time or iterations because the number of iterations that your render is going to take. And this is actually quite an important piece of information because I see it misrepresented a lot. The number of iterations that your image takes does not matter. It's going to be different for every image depending on the complexity of the lighting in the scene. So someone saying, I always render to 5,000 iterations, respectfully is an idiot. <laughs> your image is done when your image is done. So personally, what I would say is crank these up to maximum, crank that up to sort of like 100 so that you're guaranteed to get at least 100 iterations. Max time, again, crank that all the way up. And then you can use your render quality and set it to, you know, render quality one doesn't really make a huge amount of difference. It's the converged ratio. Now you're going to hear a lot of people arguing that the devs say it's impossible to get to 100%. But I very, very rarely leave my renders to run until completion anyway. So I'm firmly of the opinion that if you were to set this to maybe four and set this to 100 and then keep an eye on your render as you're doing other things. And then when it achieves a ratio or convergence that you're happy with, when the noise is at a level that you're comfortable with, then you can manually stop your render and you know that you've done your best. By limiting the converged ratio, what you're risking is having your render nowhere near finished, but finishing automatically. And then you're going to have to start all over again. So, you know, ignoring people's arguments about whether or not it's possible to achieve 100% and their rationale behind this. My my point on this is give Das Studio as much of a fighting chance of creating a good image as possible. Even if you're dealing with hardware limitations, crank all of these up, watch your render. If you can't watch your render, go out, do whatever it is you got to do. It'll still be going when you come back. And then at least you know that 
you're in control of when it finishes and das studio doesn't have to do any of that kind of decision making for you optimization just leave max path length on minus one that controls how many times the light is going to bounce um, if you mess around with that you can seriously mess up how your eyes are going to look caustic sampler is if you're using glass that refracts light into weird patterns um, again that's highly situational and 99% of the time completely unnecessary um, if you're taking a, you're creating a render of a glass lamp uh, or a grass glass vase that's reflecting light or anything like that then you can use it but otherwise there's no real good reason to instancing optimization is an interesting one because this is something that can cause problems in your eyes when you render sometimes you'll see black lines inside the eyes um, this is a, a way of removing those lines is by going from cycling through them from auto to memory to speed and then quite often that will fix the issue filtering i would say leave your firefly filter on because that does help remove those silly little orange dots that you'll get around nominal luminance i wouldn't really bother with that noise degrain filtering yeah just leave that as it is in default honestly denoiser never touch it um again this is one of those hotly debated topics um denoisers as a whole are rubbish they remove detail from your images and they spoil the look. They make everything look plastic. They make everything look unrealistic. If you're seriously struggling to get renders within a reasonable time, don't use Daz's Denoiser. Take your images into Photoshop or GIMP or whatever software you're using to do your post-production work and remove the noise in that because all Daz's post-denoiser does is blurs your image. It's an edge detect blur, so yeah, it will preserve some of the details, but it's going to make things look garbage. And we're here for photorealism, folks. Otherwise, we wouldn't be using iRay. So the bloom filter, this allows you to create bloom effects, and this is one that I encourage you to play around with. You turn it on, and then a whole new bunch of things open up. The blur filter radius, that enables you to change the size of the blur that's going to happen with the bloom the filter threshold this is where you tell daz how bright the pixels must be before they start getting bloom so um basically if you want a light bulb to be bloomed out but everything else to be normal then you'd set this really high whereas if you want everything to be bloomy then you'd set this really low again highly situational tends not to use it and then i don't even touch the the last two there's no real need to Tone mapping is the next one that you're going to use a lot. And this is basically where you set your images render properties as if you were viewing the scene through a camera. Now, I never ever touch exposure value because it's a bit like using your camera in automatic. Yeah, you can adjust it, but you have no control over these things. <laughs> Having said that, in Das Studio, shutter speed, f-stop and ISO make absolutely no difference whatsoever. Those are just there for people like me who have photography in their hobbies or if you're a professional photographer and are used to adjusting your exposure by adjusting these three properties. It kind of gets close to the calculations that you would be receiving if you were doing these adjustments so for example if i was to change my iso from 100 to 200 the light would get twice as bright if i was to change my f-stop from f 1.2 to f 2.8 yes again it would get twice as dim so those are there um, if you're not used to using a DSLR, then yeah, use the exposure value instead. Um, it does the same thing. These are just kind of mock-ups to make it easy for people to um, change their exposure. Vignetting is where you can get that sort of 
um, dark edges around your image, which are going to help you create a kind of highlight on the middle. But again, I don't ever use it. I prefer to use juxtaposition and composition to make with the camera or make the viewer's eye look at the subject. Um, burn highlights per component and burn highlights and crush blacks. This is where you kind of kind of adjust the gamma and the saturation of your image. Um, these four, so if you've got a lot of highlights in your image, you can sort of burp, blow them out by changing your burn highlights, crushing your blacks. It, these are all terms that you're going to get used to using, um, particularly if you're doing a lot of photo editing. But essentially, this is basically how you adjust the brightness and the contrast and the saturation of your image. Um, I would never really touch burn highlights or crush blacks because there's, again, no real needs to. And then lastly, we've got the environment tab. And this is where we choose how we're going to light our scene, whether we're going to use an HDRI dome, which is basically just a big sphere that sits around the entire scene and casts light around the scene. Um, or if we're going to just go with the scene lights only, so the lights that we've got in our room or wherever, then you can choose to draw the dome or not. So you could have it light in the scene, but invisible environment intensity and environment map are basically two numbers that are multiplied together to decide how bright the lights in your HDRI are. Next, we've got the environment lighting resolution and lighting blur. Again, I never ever touch that because most of the time you want your lighting to be whatever your HDRI is. Dome orientation X, Y, and Z just allows you to rotate your dome along those axes in case you want to hide something that's on the horizon or something like that. If you want all of your HDRI to be um, sky or something like that, you can rotate it to hide the ground and you can use that as well to manipulate where the light source like the sun is actually coming from. And then dome rotation is just rotation around the X and Y axis. Um, and that, that's really all there is to it. You can add draw ground if you want to add shadows underneath your character's feet. But more often than not, unless you're using a perfectly flat floor in a room or something, you're probably going to want the shadows to be cast naturally from your light source instead. Um, I could sit here and talk for literally hours about everything that's available in these tabs, but it's far better to stop now while I've thrown all of that information at you. And we'll cover some more basics, some more beginner guides in upcoming videos. We'll probably make this a bit of a series so that you guys can learn the very basics and hopefully start banging out some really good renders. Thanks very much for watching this. I hope you found it useful. Let me know what you think in the comments below and I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.